So we're going to do another video talking about um, the predictions handout. So we introduced this uh, to the students after, uh, during the third visit and after the lecture. So the third visit has a, uh, has a few things that we do during the visit. Uh, this is the last thing we do and it goes right after the lecture. The students um, don't use this uh, on the day of, they use it once they complete their structures. So at this point in time they haven't built their structures, but we go through this handout because they'll complete it before we come in the fourth time. So in between the third visit and the fourth visit, the, the students will build their structures and they'll, com they'll complete the worksheet using this handout uh, and they'll have it completed when we show up on the last day. Uh, but since we won't be there when they finish their structures, we introduce uh, this handout um, on the third visit. So we'll pass it out and then we give the students a chance to, to read it. And once they, once they uh, go read the objective and kind of skim through the rest, and once they do that, we'll go over it together. So I'll start off there. So you guys have read the objective of this worksheet, or of this, uh, of this handout. Um, and specifically, we're going to use this handout for two things. Number one, to predict the maximum expected acceleration. And number two, to predict whether or not your structure will resonate. That's actually old. That's not in there anymore. Um, I want to make sure this isn't an old video at all. Oh, I think it's right. I think that's just not supposed to be in there. Okay, well to anyone watching the video, this part of the curriculum is, uh, is in question whether or not we'll use it to predict residents. Um, since we only shape their structure uh, on, a, on a ground motion, uh, the residence prediction isn't, isn't uh, really meaningful. And it also would require us to go over uh, frequency content, which which uh, is a pretty hard step since we already go over response spectrum. So mainly we'll be using this spreadsheet to predict the maximum expected acceleration in your structure. Um, you guys remember these concepts? We just talked about that in the lecture: natural frequency and natural period. In our lecture, we also talked about a few different graphs and a few different plots. They're summarized in this table here. Uh, so the ground acceleration tells us how the ground is moving. The structure acceleration tells us how the structure will move in response to the ground motion. And the response spectrum tells us the ma maximum expected acceleration for different natural frequencies. And it's a guide rail to design. Each of these graphs depend on different things. So the ground acceleration depends only on earthquake motion. The structure acceleration depends on the earthquake motion and the structure's properties. The response uh, spectrum depends on the earthquake motion and on several combinations of material properties. This could also say structural properties, not material. So in order to predict the maximum acceleration, we have five steps. Uh, we investigate the expected ground motion. We calculate the natural frequency of our structure. We then predict the maximum expected acceleration. Then we record data during testing and we compare predictions to the experimental results and we discuss accuracy. So this is the ground motion that your structure will experience and we can use it to investigate the expected ground motion. This stuff is pretty self-explanatory, and you can let the students read it. And there's questions to go over just to kind of start a conversation. We don't have to go over that. We'll spend time here. So, to calculate the natural frequency and natural period of the structure, we need to know two properties. We need to know mass, and we need to know stiffness. So, Mass is pretty easy because we can measure that. Once you've completed your structure, uh, we can put it on a scale and measure it. Uh, after that, we'll add 
2.27 kilograms to account for the mass that's going to be applied to our structure during testing. Second, we make an assumption that our structure stiffness is proportional, is proportional to the stiffness of a previous balsa wood structure based on the percentage of material used. So, long story short, we had a structure similar to this and we were able to uh, put it on a shape table and measure its natural frequency. From there, we developed an equation that will approximate your structure stiffness based on how much material it uses in proportion to the, to the structure that we measure. Uh, so that's this equation here. Uh, stiffness, or K, is equal to 4.3B plus 5.7G plus 15S. Um, each of those variables are defined here. So, when, after you finish your structure, You'll, be, you'll, you'll know how much length of braces you added to your structure, and how many gusset plates, and how, uh, the area of the shear wall. And you can plug those numbers in to the stiffness equation. And the stiffness equation calculates, uh, it will take into account the change of units from US to the metric. So we're putting in uh, inches and inches squared into the equation, but it'll spit out uh, a stiffness in newtons per meter. And the reason we use newtons per meter is because we're also measuring kilograms. Uh, how accurate do you guys think? If you had to guess, uh, how, do you think that this makes this makes sense to calculate a structure stiffness uh, in proportion to how many how many braces we add and how much shear wall? Yes, because the mass they all have different masses. Yeah. So what about what about the stiffness of the structure? If I uh, if I add braces, do we expect to get to get stiffer? Yeah. And if we add shear walls, do we expect to get stiffer? Yeah. Yes. But each of those materials uh, provides a different amount of stiffness. That's why 4.3 is different than 15. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but if I put if I put a bunch of braces in only one location. And uh, and nothing anywhere else. Did our we don't know how much stiffer our structure got, mm. right? So the, this this equation, uh, there's ways that it is accurate, but there's uh, it, it's not going to be completely accurate. So um, the more symmetric that your structure is, the more accurate this equation will be. But the more odd and uh, asymmetric that your that your configuration of braces and shear walls is um, will we'll make this less accurate. But we can use it to approximate. So once we have K and M, we can calculate our natural frequency and natural period using the equations uh, above in the handout. Now that we have natural period, we can predict the maximum expected acceleration. And we'll do that using figure two. So figure two is our response vector for the Kobe earthquake, which is the first earthquake that we'll uh, test your structure on. We only predict the acceleration for the first earthquake and not the other two, because not all of the structures will survive earthquake one. Hopefully they all do, but it's not, not a guarantee. So we'll only predict the acceleration for the first earthquake. So how do we use that? Well, once, once you calculate your natural period, You'll come to this graph. Let's say you calculate a natural period of 0.4 seconds. Then you'll come to this graph, you look at 0.4, you'll travel, you'll travel up the line, and you'll, you'll hit the response vector. And you can measure what acceleration corresponds to that natural frequency. And that will be your maximum excel, uh, expected acceleration during the earthquake. Now, how do we check that to actual results? Well, what we do is during testing, uh, well, this is UC San Diego staff, but whoever the staff or personnel is, will attach an accelerometer to the top of your structure to collect data from the test. So this accelerometer measures the acceleration that is, uh, that is happening at the top of the structure uh, with respect to time. Uh, this data will provide your team with a structure acceleration time history that might look something like this. 
and this has a maximum acceleration. It could be positive or negative, but that just means that it's going left or right. And you'll measure the maximum uh, acceleration from this graph and you compare it to what you predicted. And uh, using those numbers, you'll, you'll predict an accuracy score using this equation. Uh, we should note that this score is not included in your PI, but it will be a topic of discussion. So what is your PI? Performance index. Performance index. And, and why do we use it? Let me, let me rephrase the question. What happens to the team with the highest PI? You win. You win. So the PI uh, will, uh, will tell you who wins, which is, uh, it's not in this spreadsheet. The PI will tell you which team wins. But we don't use uh, the accuracy of your predictions to calculate which team wins. The reason we don't do that is because we gave you these graphs, and if if we were inaccurate in making these graphs, then your result would be inaccurate. So uh, so it doesn't make sense to to uh, change your score, your PI score, based on these predictions. But it will be a good topic of discussion to understand the difference between what we predict as engineers and what might end up happening in reality. And we can talk about why it's in, in, uh, accurate and why it's inaccurate. So those are your, uh, this, that's the prediction handout. From here, you guys will finish building your structures and you'll complete this worksheet um, before we come to the final day of testing. Thanks.